Hi, good evening, everybody. This is Pastor David here. And today is another session of Once Upon a Time with Rinpoche. And today the topic is going to be on uh, meeting Doji Shukden. So, yeah, it's a big one. And um, as you can see, we have a new um, desk. <laughs> Manjushi has turned into Doji Shukden uh, for the occasion. Rinpoche remains, of course. And um, so I, I basically, this is going to go back way back into time for me. Um, sometime uh, 17, 17, 18 years back for me. And um, when I first met Rinpoche, that's the time when I first met Rinpoche, that period when um, I was introduced to Doji Shukun. And I will tell you why in the circumstances in a short while. I'm just buying a little bit of time so that more people can come on. And um, let me see who is on. Um, a shout out to everyone who has met Doji Shukden, who is practicing Doji Shukden. Um, please share with me how. You don't have to write a whole long story. I know, you know, you don't have to like, you know, do a whole 100 word, 200 word pair, you know, thesis on uh, a story on, on how you met Dodi Shukden. You can just tell me in general, oh, from the blog, to Rinpoche, to a friend, um, that, and it's something like that, you know, just a short one will do. I'll be, it'd be very interesting to read about your own experience on how you met Dodi Shukden. All right. Oh, anyway, let me go to that place and see some uh, who's on. Unfortunately, I am using an old laptop. It's a little slow. Okay, I'm on. Oh, oh I see. Hi, Jerry. Hi, F oh, well, Freon is here. <laughs> Hi, Pastor Shin. Hi, Esther. Thank you for joining me, joining us, passing around, and Sharon Ong. Thank you. Um, if you would like, please share with me, any of you, um, your own experience on how you met Dojishin. Okay, I think it's enough people, and I will just start the story anyway, right? Because it's going to be a slightly long one today. Um, when I first met Rinpoche, it was at the gym. I think I mentioned it two sessions ago. Um, I met Rinpoche at the gym, not Doji Shukin, just Rinpoche. <laughs> so what happened was um, I know nothing about Dharma. I don't know anything about, you know, Tibetan Buddhism, of, of uh, Galuk tradition. I barely knew any Dharma, in fact. So what happened was um, Rinpoche did invite me on one occasion to his house for dinner with some, a, small, a few of his students and friends. So um, I remember when I went to his house. It was a double-story link house in Banda Utama. All right. And um, as I entered into the house, I remember this very clearly. It was a living room, of course. And then there was a dining area behind it, dining and um, kitchen. All right. So the living area had no images of Doji Shukten. It was, um, it was a TV console, the Dalai Lama, and a, and a, and a picture collage you know, there's a there's a frame that has many pictures of, of various gurus of Rinpoche, and that's on the TV console. And also, there's another console with a large porcelain Kuan Yin, some smaller Buddha images, and a white Tara statue. And I remember it was really striking because Rinpoche had really good taste. That wall was um, was turquoise. This wall was saffron yellow so it was very striking and it had lights spotlight shining so it was it was very um engaging visually so i was like looking at everything you know i was looking at the white tara i had no idea who it was i thought it was kuan yin at that time and then i see another kuan yin oh another kuan yin <laughs> and then um and the smaller images and then it was dinner so we were uh, rimichi brought us ushered us to his um dining area and I remember his dining area had an altar there. And there was a Song Rinpoche statue. I didn't know who it was, but now I know who it is because it was Song Rinpoche with his uh, goatee. There's a statue. And then there was a, um, a guru tree. 
And then behind, it, it is an adjoining back section where there was an altar there. It was a little dim in the area. And there was a pendant Lamo statue. And uh, no, not statue, sorry. A picture, a big picture. I first saw the picture and then I noticed pendant Lamo statue and then Doji Shukten statue. That was my first time seeing Doji Shukten. I remember that time during dinner, I, I asked Rinpoche, I wanted to ask about, actually, I was most curious about the Guru Tree because there were so many deities and I was looking every single one. It's like, wow, you know, it was very, it was very intricate. It was, there was, it was really fascinating because there's a lot of detail in, 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 in the picture. So it was a tanka, obviously, it was a frame tanka. So, um, but I didn't because, you know, um, there was people there and then Rinpoche was talking about something else. I can't remember what it was that time. But, um, and then when I got a chance, I did ask, but I didn't ask about the, the Guru Tree. I was, I asked about um, the image there. That image on a lower altar, above was Pendant Lamo on a shelf. And as a lower altar, there was a, a, a golden statue of Doji Shukran. It was actually in color. The statue of Doshun is in color, but the, the hat was gold, the sword was gold, and the implements all, was all gold. So it was kind of shining because there was, there was, a, um, there was a light, some kind of offering Rimji offered, and it was shimmering. So I was, I was like, who is that? <laughs> and Rimji said, Doji Shukten, obviously. And when, I, when Rimji told me Doji Shukten, I was like, who? <laughs> I had to ask a few times because I just it couldn't register because it was Tibetan, and it was my first time listening to Tibetan words, uh, Tibetan name, a, a deity that's um, in Tibetan. So I couldn't get it the first few times. I remember that was my first exposure to Doji Shukden. All right, and um, yeah, okay. Hi, Larry. Thank you for joining me and um, in my story of, of Rinpoche and of me meet, um, meeting Doji Shukden through Rinpoche. That was my first time uh, hearing his name. Um, subsequently, there was an, uh, I think it was months later, Rinpoche told me about Doji Shukden in a sense that he wanted me to write about Doji Shukden. He said there is a need to write about Doji Shukden um, for me. And it would be good for me. And uh, But before I can write, I should read up. So Rinpoche gave me a number of resource, uh, online resource, websites, um, a number of uh, books. It was printed material, not really books. It was printed material. I remember notes um, from various sources to read up. And uh, at that time, I was not too keen about the whole writing research thing, but I was, I was still interested in the sense of learning. So I read up and um, yeah, that was, that was the time when Rimshi, he didn't tell me to practice. Rimji never told me to pray to Doji Shukten that time. He just told me you should learn about him. It will be good for you. And so I, I read up I re and he, he encouraged me to read up both about the practice, about his incarnation, and also about um, the other aspects, the controversy, and, and, um, and if I had any questions to ask him. So that was how I was um, got into it at that time. Rimji never gave me the mantra. I couldn't find the mantra at that time. But I could, um, I didn't know what a mantra was actually. <laughs> that it was so, it was so pathetic. But I didn't, really, didn't even know what a mantra is. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, uh, I was I was told to 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 research about it, and then now it comes to this part that was very very interesting. It's a little mystical. I, on one occasion when I was with Rinpoche, just the two of us in his in his. Uh, in his dining hall, and Rimbaji had a phone call. Yeah, Rimbaji had a phone call, and I can't remember if it was him getting a phone call from his phone or he went to, to call someone because he went upstairs, but I can hear Rimbaji's voice, and he was 
and it was the first time hearing Rimbaji speaking in Tibetan. Rimbaji spoke in Tibetan, and um, I could understand that it was Tibetan because I couldn't understand what it meant. Yeah, then I didn't know how Tibetan sound like. It was my first time, but it was another language, so I assume it was Tibetan. And um, you know what was interesting? For a moment, because Rimbaji went on and on. You know, when Rimbaji on that, that time, Rimbaji, when he talks to someone, is not a five minute, ten minute. It was like one hour, two hour phone conversation. Any any gathering it, with Rimbaji is is usually half the day to the entire night to dawn. <laughs> That's Rimbaji, typical Rimbaji. So Rimbaji was up for a long time, and he was talking and talking and talking. So I was. I was just, you know, playing my phone and looking around, <laughs> you know, when Rimbaji's not around, so I start looking at everything. In, in... <laughs> and I, 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 that I had a weird experience. The voice from upstairs shifted. It shifted towards Doji Shukten. Uh, for a moment, I couldn't tell if Rimbaji's voice was coming from upstairs or from the statue. I was like, wow, what happened? You know, I didn't know what's going on. So when Rinpoche came down later, I told Rinpoche, and this is, this is exactly how I, I, I phrased it, because I remember, and actually I forgot about it. Rinpoche reminded me of, of a couple of years back. Um, I said that if that, I, do, I didn't remember Dodishin's name, by the way, if that statue, that deity has a voice, he would have your voice. That's what I said to Rimbaji. And um, I, I just thought it was wow, you know, in a sense that um, there was some kind of sign. It was, it was mystical. And um, it, for, for Rimbaji, he didn't say a word. He didn't say anything. And I forgot about it until Rimbaji reminded a few years ago. Rimbaji said that, and in hindsight, Rimbaji said that uh, it shocked him that anyone would say something like that. And, um, and then he told me, uh, he did, th this time he told me he said what he felt because at that time we just carry on a conversation blah 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 you know and I wasn't I didn't think much about it and uh, yeah from there from there on uh, Rimuchi just encouraged me to read up to write to read up to, uh, and being me that time I was very very young I was in my 20s um, young in a sense that um sit down, research, and write. It's not something that was really good at. So it was a struggle. And um, I had to... Uh, I didn't... I didn't In the first attempt, I didn't finish the work. And uh, so what happened was, um, yeah, Rinpoche was like not happy with me because I promised Rinpoche that I would write about Doji Shukden. And I didn't. I didn't fulfill my, my promise. So uh, what happened was um, there are other things that happened, which I, I won't talk about it here because today will be sp specifically about Doji Shukden. And then later on, there was a second attempt. And this time, Rinpoche was very serious. He wanted me very badly to write about it. And he said, I'll get you sponsored. That was the time I was in between jobs. Because when Rinpoche first talked about Doji Shukden, I was working. I was working in, um, I, if I'm not mistaken, Canon Marketing Malaysia. So I had a day job. And, um, and then the evenings or whatever, I come and look for Rinpoche and we go out or whatever. What happened was uh, then after that, I, um, I resigned from the job and, and I was in between jobs. I, I, it took me a year before I got my second job. And during that period of time, Rinpoche was dead serious that I should write. And I was... No. <laughs> and so what Rimuchi did was Rimuchi um found a sponsor for me to write. And I reluctantly agreed and attempt and together with another writer. Okay. So there was two of us. We were to write this um book on Dodi Shukten. So um we didn't finish it. Yeah. To 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 Keep the long story short, we did not finish it, and Rimbaché was not happy with me, and um and he, and because I during the time when I attempted to write it, I did write bits and pieces of, of it. Uh, Rimbaché told me you haven't finished the work and you collected the money, you should return it the money. So I did, I returned the money, 
So in the end, what happened was um, years later, guilty conscience. Then when I started knowing about Doshin and then started knowing more about Dharma and all that, I, I realized, okay, that is really bad broken Samaya. I didn't know what Samaya was anyway, but then and then fi finally later I realized what it meant. And um, I guilty conscience. Lah. So when Rimji was not really happy with me, so I decided that, okay, since Rimji really wanted me to write, so I, I, I did it. I um, spent a long time composing something out and I sent it to Rimuji and offered it as an apology for my broken um, promises. And um, yeah, so that was it. It was not used for anything, but it was, uh, I remember, it was interesting because that was my journey to knowing Dojin. It was because of that whole process. I, I know quite a lot about Dojin, the five families Dojin, Dojin's previous incarnations, and uh, because I had to do research and um, about the practice, about the puja, and, and uh, of the lineage lamas, you know, Pabongka Rinpoche, Jijang Rinpoche, who they are, and how they picture in the role of Doji Shukden's lineage. So I have to learn all that, you know. Yeah, so, um, okay, one more thing um, besides that. Actually, there's a lot of things I need to tell. Okay, let me see. One one thing in the front. I, I don't know whether you guys are aware. Rinpoche, at some point in his past, was training to be an oracle. So, But he didn't finish his, his uh, training as an oracle because um, his recognition as a Rinpoche arrived. So he was enthroned as a Rinpoche, and um, his teachers told him that you cannot be an oracle and a lama. A lama is more important than an oracle. At that time, Rinpoche didn't think he was a lama because he didn't know he was before his recognition. He just wanted to benefit a lot of people and he figured that to be an oracle is such a wonderful way to help people, sanctioned beings. So he trained under Jigong Rinpoche and he was, he was uh, doing retreats specifically to open his channels to, to be an oracle. So Rinpoche, although he didn't finish his training, he could channel. Okay, checking trance and channeling is different. Channeling is partial trance. That means Rinpoche is partially conscious of uh, what's happening. Full trance is you, you get knocked out. That means when, when the deity enters, you completely fall asleep and then the deity takes over. So Rinpoche would do a bit of channeling. And uh, Rinpoche doesn't like to channel. In the beginning, he had to do a little bit more because um, he noticed Malaysians in general um, would have a little bit more faith when it, the words came from a deity like Doji Shukden. So Rinpoche would channel. And um, many times, and when I first knew Rinpoche that period of time, the, the next five to 10 years, that period of time, right? Rinpoche channel on many occasions, uh, on individual basis and as a, and as a, and as a, for a group of his Rinpoche students. So there was, for some reason, when, when Doji, when Doji Shun channels, he would give advice to everybody except me. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> I always, you know, some, when, 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 when Doshin, he's very, very kind, very compassionate, he will, you know, we're depending on how, how much time he has, like, suddenly he doesn't have much time, he say a few words and then he has to leave. So he will give a kata to everybody, then I'll be the only one like, what about me? <laughs> so, but there's one time he did, he did turn to me and he did give me, he did tell me something and this is what it went, how it went. Um... He turned to me and he said, he didn't say anything first, sorry. He gestured. He used his hands. He did this. Are you looking, you, you look at my hands, huh? What it is, is a maze, going through a maze. So the hand is, a, is the movement of and, and going to maze and going through the maze. And Rinpoche's, and, and sorry, Dori Shugden said to me, I gave you the dream last night. Do you remember it? And um, I said, yes. How did you know? <laughs> I didn't ask that loud. In my mind, I was thinking that. So I was like, you know, when, when, when Dojishin told me that, right, my, the hair on my back stood on end, you know. And, and he gave me some advice. A very short one. Um, 
it's something to do with that period of time. To be honest, I cannot remember for the life of me, cannot remember what it was, but it was it certainly made an impact in me that time. That was the one and only time that Dojishin gave me advice. Other than that, it was just totally um um how I say is everybody has advice given to, but not me. <laughs> so it doesn't matter. Um fortunately, I think anyway, Rimichi and Dojishin is one. So Rimichi has given me a lot of personal advice. Some of them I followed, some I have not. So I, you know, I figured that I think it's more important for the Lama's advice anyway. So later on, Rimichi gave us the practice officially to a small group of us who are ready. And uh, he would ask us individually if we want the practice. And then uh, Rimichi would give it privately. During that time, Rimichi explained that Dojo shooting practice is not something that is to be pr uh, publicly on display. Um, this is not just about Doji Shukden as a deity because of the controversy. It is, Rimiji say it is, but it's also practice that is for yourself, for your uh, practice. So it's not something to be on display. So he started giving, giving us teachings on how to do the practice and the benefits and who Doji Shukden was in his previous life, his incarnations. As you all know, now yet there's a lot of information ever since uh, Rimiji has come up publicly on this practice, there was Rimji has given a lot of information on the incarnation, the practice, and so forth. But Rimji said this about Doji Shukden. All right. Firstly, he said it about protectors in general. Then he said about Doji Shukden specifically, about protectors protectors in general by tradition. All right, by tradition in Tibet in the old days, protector practice is not given simply. It's not a practice that when the moment you enter the monastery or when the Lama, when the Lama meets people, they, it's given to people. It is something that's given later, much later, when you have received initiation of your Yidam, if it's uh, Lama Tsongkhapa, Manjushri, uh, Chen Rezik, Vajapani, or Tara, whatever initiation to do the practice, to understand the practice, to, to go into the meditations, to study the Lam Rim, three principal paths, to understand the purpose of practicing or leaving samsara, renunciation. And then after all that, doing retreats of the Yidam, and then the Lama will consider giving you a protector and you will be uh, given the practice, sometimes giving the life entrustment, which is a protector initiation. It's called a life entrustment or a sokte life entrustment initiation for protectors. So Rimaji said that was in the old days. Nowadays, uh, people don't come to the Dharma because of enlightenment, because of, some, uh, of wanting to leave samsara, because of, um, you know, of wanting to receive initiation, to become, uh, to transform their mind, to practice mind training, mind transformation. No, people come to the Dharma because they have problems. People come, they're looking for solutions. People come to the Dharma because um, they have uh, afflictions, for example, spirit affliction. The, you know, whatever, the, the, whatever problems they have, that is usually because they don't know the Dharma. So when you, you teach them the Dharma, the Dharma has everything. It's all encompassing. It has everything to solve all your everyday, but it's not immediate. You need to practice the Dharma and then you purify the karma and all that. So what happens is it doesn't immediately solve your problem, your immediate problem. So very few people have faith in the Dharma because of that. So they, it will take a long time before they can generate that faith. So Rinpoche said, so it's more skillful these days for, for Lamas they, to introduce them to a protector that will help solve their problems. So when they find that the, the protector exists, that he, that he grants wishes, protects you from spirits, helps you overcome your obstacles, helps you get um, uh, overcome your, your issues, right? Then you have faith, and then you start looking at the deities as real, and then you go into studying the Dharma. You're inspired to do so because if there is the protector, there is definitely the Buddhas. There's definitely Tara Manjushri and all that. Definitely, isn't it? Anyway, if you have any questions, also let me know. I know everybody is giving hearts and uh, folded hands. Thank you very much. 
I appreciate that very, very much. Um, just, you know, if you have any thoughts, uh, share, me, share with me how you met Dr. Shukden. So the point about this is that Rinpoche said, these days people need that. And it will, it will inspire a bigger group of people to practice the Dharma. So that is why Rinpoche focused on protected practice. In by tradition, most Galuk Lamas do not do that. And um, so what happens is people come in because of the protector for the immediate problems, and then they get solved. Their problems get solved, and it helps them. It's one way of benefiting the, the public. And then um, what happens is a smaller group of people would stay and look into Dharma and find it meaningful and practice the Dharma. That is the Lamrim that you're studying. That is the eight verses of thought transformation. That is the Lama, Lama Tsongkhapa practice, you know, Guru Yoga. That is um, the uh, uh, Tara and so forth. All right. So what Rinpoche said is that because of that, um, that's why he has turned it around. And among all the Dharma protectors, Rinpoche's protector practice comes from Capture Song Rinpoche. And it is something that he keeps very sacred. So what happens is um, it is also well known. It is well known within the um, Tibetan circles and the monasteries that Dodishudan Pujas, Dodishudan practice is very powerful and effective, very quick to gain results. Not that the other deities, protectors, have no, uh, are not quick. It's just that Dodishudan is quicker because of affinity. So he, he highly recommends Dodi Shukden for that sole reason. So when it's quicker, when it's faster, when it's more effective, what happens is people have faith when they get their problems solved. So that's the whole purpose in why Dodi Shukden, uh, why Rinpoche um, recommend Dodi Shukden very much for people these days. Yeah, I was going to get to that, but before I get to that, <laughs> Oh, another thing was when Rinpoche channeled, I was I have always one one obs observation I, I had about, about Rinpoche's channeling was that Rinpoche would twitch. There would be a muscle here, right above his um what do you call this? The upper lip, above the mustache. There's a twitch here that Rinpoche does when he channels. Because some channeling it depends on the person that he's channeling for depends on the circumstances. You know, some, some channeling is very peaceful. All you know, is, because it sounds peaceful, there's very little breathing, and, and it's just all you know that Rinpoche is cha channeling is because of this twitch. And then Rinpoche's face turns like a little ruffle. Sometimes it's that, sometimes it's more obvious that he's, he's ruffled. So I've asked Rinpoche once, you know, I asked Rinpoche, how do you move this muscle? Can you move this muscle? And Rinpoche looked at me <laughs> and rolled his eyes. I cannot move that muscle. It's obviously during that time, it's, it's moving because of the energy of Doji Shukden, not because, you know, I'm not trying to fake this, okay? You know? Because <laughs> at that time, I was... I don't know. I was just observing. I was just, you know, the whole thing, I was just observing everything and... I can't help it some because uh, I'm not sure whether if it's real, it's Rinpoche pretending to be Doji Shukden because I, I don't know Doji, uh, um, uh, Dharma very well. I don't know Rinpoche. I mean, I knew Rinpoche very well by then, but I was just, I just wanted to, to, to test it out. So I asked Rinpoche. <laughs> I don't know why. Usually I dare not ask things like that, but that time I was, you know, curiosity killed the cat. Lah. So I asked. So Rinpoche made all sorts of faces to prove the point that he couldn't twitch this muscle. He really contorted his face to the best of his ability. And, um, and, and whatever he did, he couldn't move. Because it's just one muscle here that twitch when Rinpoche channels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was just my observation. And I thought I'd share that with you. And um, Rinpoche had a very deep fascination of oracles, and Rinpoche had a very deep faith in Dodishun. Totally, totally, very deep, very deep connection with Dodishun for obvious reasons. 
that some of you know, some of you don't know, doesn't matter. It's it's from lifetimes, Rinpoche's previous life. All right. So what happens is um, my first experience of uh, Dojo Shun, besides through Rinpoche's channeling, was through a trance. Okay. This was very dramatic. Okay. And um, this is in Nepal. Maybe one or two of you were there, the senior students. And what happened was uh, we were on pilgrimage in Nepal and we got invited to Rohan Rinpoche's teacher's uh, Ladrang. Ladrang is a lama's home and office. Because a lama is a public figure, so what happens is uh, the, the house that he, that he stays in, he resides in, is also um, where he does his work. So what happens is... Um, during when we when we visited, we were invited to a trance of uh, a protected deity. Rimuji did not tell us who it was that time, and um, but I knew because I really did some research, so I knew. Let me see. Did I know? I think so. I think I think I did by then. So what happened was um, this experience. This this oracle was from Ladakh. And uh, he's kind of like an older gentleman, very small, but very charismatic. And when we enter the room to sit down, right, in Tibet, typical Tibetan uh, um, prayer halls, this is a, it's a fairly large prayer hall, medium size, medium size. So there, there was rows of seats at the back, and then there's cushions in the middle because it's a trance, so there's a lot of people, a lot of people, a lot of us. Already the pilgrims were like a lot. I don't know, I can't remember, 20, 30 of us. And then there was a group of Tibetans, some monks, some lay people, and they were crowding, and there were so many. And then the oracle was standing in front of us, his back facing us. He was looking at the altar, and his hands were shivering already. He was in partial dress. Because the when you take trance, you have to have uh, the regalia, the... the, the, the what do you call it? The the I wouldn't call it a costume. Uh, the official clothes, armor, and all that, you know. So they haven't put on the hat, you know, the big round, you know, the hat with all the flags. And um, so what happens was he was already shaking, and the monks was chanting already. They were invoking Doji Shukten. and at the at the point, if you re if you have done Doji Shukten pujas with us, the monthly Doji Shukten pujas, there's a time where the 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 part where they start om dhamma ratnita then you know few times three times there's a mantra they recite and then that is the time when dojishin took trance because the the you can feel the energy you know you know that it, it's electricity it's electrifying um the oracle jumped and to our horror, he turned to face us, and there was a kata, and he strangled himself. We were like, but he was okay, like, but you can hear him choking. I remember his this choking sound. I was like, what's happening? <laughs> he, yeah, and then he, he let go of the kata. And um, they, they, before that, of course, the monks already hurriedly. There's a certain part before the, that they, the monks. They know the timing, you know, when to put on everything. So they put on everything, and then they, the whole thing, all that happened. So he was in full dress, and then he strangled himself, and then, um, and then, and then he immediately made offerings to Dagom Rimuji, which is Rimuji's teacher, on the throne. And then um, I think Rimuji came up to him, if I remember correctly. Rimuji came up, and um, he offered a. Uh, 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 Offerings to Rimuji, I think a kata or something like that, and they, they spoke, and then um, and it was a very quick thing because he left. It was, uh, uh, there was a commotion la. That time I don't know what's happening because it was it got a, a lot of people. There was a lot of um, things happening. So then he left. Then another another trance happened, and I mean in hindsight now I know who it was la because that time I didn't know. Now I know it's Kachemapo, and he stayed longer and he he greeted every single one of us. And um, every single, and Rimuji was there. Rim, it's typical of Rimuji. What he did was, uh, when we met Kachimapo, Rimuji would ask us if we have any questions. And if we don't, he would actually 
um, introduce us, you know, one by one, you know, oh, this is this is David. The time was not pastor yet, lah. This is David. He's going to be a writer, and blah 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 blah. The background telling Kacha Mapo and please bless him, and then uh, uh Kacha Mapo bless me. Same thing with uh, not just with Kacha Mapo. For me, even Dago Rimuchi Rimuchi did the same thing, and uh, Rimu because this is this one I know because I would have forgotten about it, but Rimuchi was very kind to remind me years later and um to uh what 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 happened. All right. Okay, anyway, I, I think there's some questions, sorry. Okay, there's one from Fion. Oh, this, this statue. Okay, the next one, after I finish the questions, I'll get to this. Actually, this... <laughs> okay. Hi, this is from Yvonne. Hi, Pastor Day. Uh, hi, Pastor. When did Rimuchi started giving Dojin practice to the public? 2016. 15 or 16, I forgot. It's fairly recent. Fairly recent. This is uh, with permission from um, Rinpoche's teachers and Dodishutin. Because before that, uh, Rinpoche has never wanted to really hide the practice, um, nor did he want to do, announce it to the world either. But things changed on that year when um, uh, it was given, the permission was given. All right, it was, and it was decided also by the committee. Sharon says, whenever Rimuchi channels, the energy in the room changes. Yeah. And um, even when, I mean, even trance is even more dramatic because of the, 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 the music, you know, the, the instruments that they play. It was even the puja, you know, you just sit in the Doryushun puja, the energy is electrifying because of the, the instruments that they use. And obviously, we are not praying to an, an, a statue, we're praying to a living deity. A deity that comes, although we we cannot see it, but we can feel. Some of us, some of us can feel. I can't feel, but I mean, you know, the you can feel the energy still. Okay. So this statue here, this one, um, the reason why Manjushri has turned to Dojin today, is because this statue was uh, was not given to me. Uh, Rimuji's, uh, what Rimuji did was Rimuji had a number of Dojishun statues and Rimuji had me invite this one and I had to pay for it. And uh, Rimuji said is the, the reason for it is so that I will collect merit. The money didn't go to me, of course, or to Rimuji. I mean, how can the money go back to me? I mean, as in the money didn't go to Rimuji, it went to the outlets. So what happens is um, this this statue was invited by me, and then I asked Rimuji to bless it. And uh, one, of, one of Rimuji's students painted it to this antique. That time Rimuji developed this antique color. Traditionally, Tibetan statues will never look like that. It will be gold face with all the features painted, and then a lot of clothes, brocades, and all that. And sometimes the whole statue will be color, full of color. Uh, if don't have, at least the face is painted in brilliant gold with the features. All right. And um, yeah, it also would be a very colorful thing. So what happened was um, I asked Rimuji to bless it and he did. And um, then later on, I kept it for a number of years. Later on, my father started practicing Doji Shukten because it was open that time. And I gave it to my father. I gave this statue to my father to for his altar. I gave all the statues that my, my dad had to for him and uh, to practice. So this this belonged to my father for a number of years until he passed away. All right. So and oh, uh, uh, Chung corrected me and he said that is twenty fourteen. Okay. Thank you very much, Chung. So what happens? What happened is uh, my this this statue belonged to my father for a number of years till he passed away, and before he passed away, I had a I had a feeling. I mean, obviously, my dad was very ill; he had cancer. So, but just before he passed away, I was supposed to travel to Nepal for for some work, and um, I had a dream and um, of 
not my father passing away, but my mother. It was really strange. My mother, my mother by that time had passed away. It was just my father. And he was, uh, he, was, um, he was suffering from cancer and he was going to treatment. He seemed to be doing all right, but I had that dream. And then, but when I woke up, I had a really strong feeling that it would be my father soon. So I asked um, Rinpoche whether I should still travel. And Rinpoche told me, you should. You should still travel. He didn't deny that uh, there's a possibility that my dad would pass away, but he said that um, I should still travel. And since I'm traveling to Nepal, what a perfect opportunity to collect a lot of merits from my father. And he told me what to do, you know, offer a lot of um, candles. I was not candles in, in Nepal. It was butter lamps. So it's butter lamps. They use ghee, you know, in the, the butter lamps. And... Um, so I offer as much as I can at all the holy places like Swayambhuna, like the Vajigini temples, in dedication to my father. And then uh, when we was finished, um, I came back earlier than that was supposed for the trip. I was supposed to come back later, but I decided to come back earlier. And I came back earlier. And um, at that time, Rinpoche told me to come meet him. And he told me that... Um, he said that I have a wonderful opportunity now to manipulate my father's passing, as in to, for him to go to take a good rebirth. All right. So he told me how. He said that you should do Dojishukten pujas every single day. Actually, it doesn't have to be Dojishukten, but his feeling for my dad is Dojishukten. He said that in general, anybody who is passing away, if the person practices and has a, a strong affinity and faith in, let's say, Lama Tsongkhapa or Manjushri, then it will be Lama Tsongkhapa or Manjushri or whatever deity it is, Kuan Yin or, so, what, or whatever, you know. So, but for my father, it was Doji Shun, and uh, this is what Rinpoche said. And um, so when you do the puja, Rinpoche said to, to visualize, he said very strongly visualize the Dharma work that my father did in his lifetime. Because my dad was um, had been a very sincere volunteer in Kachara, and um, and also that Ladrang. So Rimuchi would come very faithfully every, I don't know what is the 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 duration he did. I think every week uh, to make offerings, to clean the temple, to clean the Ladrang, the Ladrang altar, um, and he would do it faithfully and diligently. And uh, I was told that people, everybody liked my dad. Nobody really liked me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so what happened was, uh, yeah, so all that visualized is the eight auspicious sign, the seven royal emblems, and offered to Doji Shukden. It rained down on Doji Shukden. And that Doji Shukden visualized, that, that's one. Number two, Rinpoche asked me to visualize Doji Shukden on top of my dad's head. Okay, on, on top of the head. Every single day, I must do the puja without fail, because the time... Rinpoche didn't say it, but I really, I really understood what it meant. You know, time is short already for my dad. And uh, my dad has uh, discharged from the hospital because he didn't want to be in the hospital. And at that time, my, uh, Rinpoche also said that because my dad is um, close to passing, his eyes, he said, Rinpoche said, is, has, has switched to that of the bardo. This is Rimaji's words, meaning he it it so what happens is he sees a lot of things. So Rimaji told me to be don't worry. Um don't don't worry about it. Tell my dad not to worry because he is protected. It's just that because they know the spirits, the unseen beings will know when someone is dying. Because they are psychic. So they will know and they will they will come around, they will hover around more. They will come and to to witness, you know, someone, you know, it's like a new person, a new kid in the block. <laughs> That's what Rinpoche said. And so what happens is, um, so you don't have to worry. As long as you do the pujas, as long as, long as my dad is okay, everything will be fine. So that's that's what happened. So what? So I did the pujas every single day to the to the day my dad passed away. So um, Alfred Black Tea, I did the whole, uh, um, I used uh, the, the diamond path, the long one. And um, yeah, 
to you know I, I did the pujas and just before I think a week before my dad passed away, Rimichi asked to see me and he said he had a feeling. He had a he had a feeling, he had a I I I think Rimichi said a kind of a vision as in um he saw a vision of my dad being in a place where there's a lot of monks. The landscape has a lot of monks and a lot of temples. So Rinpoche said, that, oh, that's a good sign. He feels that my dad will take rebirth, a good rebirth. So Rinpoche said that most likely in a place where there is, there's Dharma, there's Sangha, and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And so, yeah. Then, you know, my dad's funeral and all that. So what happened was um, we did Dojishu Pujas, of course, and... Um, and the statue from mine became my dad, and now it's returned to me. So, I don't know. I just found, I thought it had a huge significance because we remember it with my dad. And, um, yeah, so it's, it's back to me. Um, I, but in the process, in the funeral hall, I lost the heart and the mongoose. So, I replaced the heart. I've yet to replace the mongoose, though. <laughs> I think I'm better soon. So, what happened is um, the, the heart, I, re I, I used a semi-precious stone. I offered it there. That's why there's this red dot, but you probably can't see it. It's not very clear. Okay, I have some comments here. Okay, uh, Freon asks, can we visualize Dojishun on top of the live person's head as a blessing or try to connect the person to Dojishukden? You do not need, for a, for a person who's alive, you do not need to, to pray, uh, to visualize it on the head. That is specifically for a person who is passing away. Why Rinpoche said on the head is because I didn't explain. I'm explaining it now because this is where you, when your mind passes, I mean, when you're going to die, your mind will leave through one of the orifices on the body. So one of the places it can leave is through the upper body, or the lower body, or the middle. So it's ideal that to leave, the mind leaves the upper part of the body. The ears, the the nose, the mouth, or the crown. The eye. The most ideal is the crown, because that would be that would signify a positive rebirth. It will create. It has that karmic effect. So during that time, that's why the the pujas, the uh, the pastors. Sorry, not the pujas. The pastors, uh, when they are doing um, last rites, they will put a lamrim here. They will pull the hair. They would place Lamrin, they would place a, maybe a Buddha statue, a Tsongkhapa statue, or something like that. So they would place it here to trigger that, the, the mind to leave. Okay, so that's the reason why the visualization was Dojin on top of my dad's head. I wrote an article, actually, and I think it's in the Two Minute Stories on Rinpoche's blog, detailing all of this. And... Um, so that, that's why, that's the reason. So for a living person who's not passing away, it's not necessary you to, to visualize on the head, actually. It's not necessary. But I mean, I mean, there's no harm doing that. But for a person who's dying, it is crucial. Okay, it's crucial um, that, at that point. Because why is it crucial? Because they, this is what they call the throwing karma. At that moment that karma will be triggered. Actually, that where the mind leaves is also has, has to do with many other factors, you know. The, I mean, it has to do with the person's spiritual practice. In this case, when you put something there, the person, the person has spiritual practice, then it will be triggered for positive. If the person who, is, um, who had a lot of regrets, a lot of attachment, then that will trigger a lower rebirth. They will leave through the lower part of the body, and that will be a lower rebirth. So that is the throwing karma. So you want to trigger the right throwing karma, a good throwing karma to take rebirth. A person can have a lot of good karma, a lot of merits, in fact. If the throwing karma is bad, the person can take a negative rebirth. You know, still, it is possible unless you have the power of control um, and enter into Tuktam like Rinpoche. If you don't have that, Tuktam is death meditation. Huh? So if you don't have that power, that's you and that's me. I don't think any Rinpoche or any Bodhisattvas are listening to me right now. <laughs> so I assumed. Sorry. So we don't have that kind of control. We have to take all the steps as necessary. During that time, uh, I've seen Rinpoche um, 
when a person has just passed away, it's important to do immediately a Dodeshukan Puja. That very moment a person passes away to do a puja, a black tea, uh, the whole puja, not just black tea, the whole puja, you know, the whole diamond path. And um, if possible, complete offerings, if not just the, the sukim and some uh, toma, uh, some, some bread or, or cookies or something that's toma, offer to donation to create, to generate the merits because that time is crucial. Okay, after that is 49 days, then you do pujas every, if you can afford every single day, then some, I've seen some people, they, they sponsor pujas every single 49 day. Wow, wonderful. Otherwise, if you cannot afford pujas every single day, then what happened is um, you can do 10 malas of Dorishun Mantra. Rimuchi recommends Dorishun Mantra or Omani Pemiho, depending on, up to you. And um, Rimchi has so in the past, you know, immediately when a person passed away, uh, Rimchi would do Doishin Puja and also light 100 candles. Always I hear Rimchi say, oh, light 100 candles, 100 candles for this person who has just passed away. Candles to generate the merit. Okay. Okay. Okay, there's some people, some comments here about my father. <laughs> Phoebe Yong says, I remember Uncle Lai did teach in children Dharma class. He's very patient. Oops, he jumped. He's very patient with kids. And Waiting says, I put a small DS card beside my dad's pillow when he was in hospital and put on a head when he passed on. Very good. Yeah. And then Sharon says, yes, I remember that Uncle Lai was very patient with the little ones, rather grandfatherly with my kids. Yeah, my dad was very, really into... Um, he was very, very... Um, He's very good with kids for some reason. Very nurturing, very fatherly, very, um, yeah, very, it's a very nice uh, fatherly figure. And, and but for, <laughs> so that, that, that's my dad, lah. Yeah. So that made, that endeared him to everybody. Actually, surprisingly, it's not just the kids, it's the adults. It's, it's the adults. It's, um, because I remember my father's funeral, just as a side note, right? During my father's funeral, there are so many people. It's like a, my dad is some kind of VIP, you know. There are people, of course, there's Kacharians, very, very, you know. Um, my dad is well known among Kacharians. And then his, his ex colleagues, you know, from various countries, his, his relatives, all the, you know, from the woodworks are so many people. I don't know if my, even my funeral has. Even half of the amount of people that came to my dad's, you know. But it doesn't matter. It's just a testament of what a nice person my dad was. He's a simple, unassuming man. All right. A Dodishukdan practitioner. So, I will... If you have any other questions, let me see what else. Um, I have to check my notes. Oh, okay, okay. Um, yes. I already mentioned it that uh, Rinpoche had, had recommended to Dishukten for people in general. Some people have affinity with Dodishukten, some people may not. But whatever it is, it doesn't uh, undermine his incredible effectiveness, efficacy towards people. And um, I have actually actively asked people in the past of their experience with the practice, you know, because there are ag allegations that uh, Doji Shin practice, you know, he's a spirit and there's some negative re uh, uh, negative repercussions from it so my own personal experience none i have no negative repercussion from doshin practice whatsoever and um so because of it i still investigate i ask I ask people in kachara ask sometimes if i got a chance to people who have practice on the outside i ask them too and i have never come across anybody who had any negative repercussions but the theory is the theory is Dojishin has one ability that Rinpoche has said before that uh, when you practice and you hold your commitments with Dojishukten, he is very powerful, but he cannot take your karma away. 
he cannot take your karma away. You have to purify it with your practice, either with Dodishin practice or Dharma practice in general. All right. So what happens is um, he had an uh, ability to hold back heavy negative karma, karma that would that could maybe be dangerous for you, for your livelihood, for your your own your life. You know. So what happens is he holds back a lot of this negative karma from fruitioning at this time when you hold your commitment. You see, we always talk of Samai of the Guru. There is also Samai with, with the, 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 the deities that we pray to, okay? So like Dorishin, we have some sort of Samai. Samai means um, your connection with them. So your connection with them is built up through daily practices, offerings, um, keeping up with the offerings, keeping up with practices. And with Dodi Shriptan, if you practice the Dharma, if you learn the Dharma, it strengthens that bond. Because Dodi Shriptan is not an ordinary Dharma protector. He is Manjushri. So when you practice the Dharma, even little Dharma that you know, you practice it the best of the best of your ability, like making offerings on your on your altar, uh, learning about Lama Tsongkhapa, just simple Dharma, he, it will strengthen your, your bond with uh, Doji Shukdan. All right. So uh, I wanted to bring that up because what happens is if you if um, there are situations where some people this may, may be out of laziness, maybe out of, you know, negative influence from, from rumors and hearsay and decide to give up the practice or neglect their practice, what happens is um, it's like the shield. Haven't you, haven't you watched you know, Star Wars, you know, when the, the shield comes down, then the enemy can... <laughs> so what happens is your karma will come. So where does the karma come from? Does it come from Doji Shudan? No, it does not. It comes from you. It comes from your actions in the past, whether in this life or previous lives. It doesn't matter. It's, it comes from us. Whether it's a previous life or this life, it comes from us. It doesn't come from Dodishun. It's just that Dodishun was a shield that protected you in the past. Okay, so when you neglect your practice, the shield is... You know, before it comes down, it, you know, it wavers a bit. You know I mean? So some of it will come through. So you don't want it to come through. You want it strong. That's one. Another thing is... When you practice Dharma, you learn enough Dharma, he is Manjushri. So what happens is, uh, sometimes it is time for us to experience obstacles. So what happens is, the obstacles are carefully monitored by Dodi Shukdan and his entourage to ensure that we purify our karma. The obstacle is purification. If we keep our commitments, meaning our commitments, our pujas, our daily prayers, mantras, whatever practice you're doing with Doji Shukdan, you keep it up, what happens is it will be carefully monitored to purify your karma. You see, purification and uh, um, experiencing negative karma, fruitioning of karma is very different. Purifying means that the, the source of your karma, the root karma, the root karma, the source of the karma, basically, is being purified. So you will not experience it. Because sometimes the source is not purified or is still there, we can experience many things again and again and again, and we don't want that. All right. So Dojishin has this ability to help us in that way, to nurture us. And because it's in, it also doesn't help us in the long run if for our Dharma practice, if Dojishin just stop all ka negative karma. Because he, he can't. He cannot anyway. But what happens is when on, on his watch, he can heal certain karmas you have to experience to purify it. Because actually by right, our purification practice is supposed to eliminate all together. Okay, I must highlight this because some people have this misconception of a purification practice. Uh, the purpose of purification is to purify your mind of all negative karma, all karma, okay? Not make it lighter and easier. It's not to lighten your karma. It is to remove it completely. 
that's the purpose of purification. Okay, everybody must understand that because I always keep hearing feedback from people. Oh, isn't it to lighten your karma? No, purification is to remove it completely. So what happens is sometimes, uh, why we don't remove it completely is because our motivation, our knowledge, our practice is not there. We are four opponent partners. If you've studied Lamrim, you'll know this. The four opponent partners is not fully there. Our regret is not there. Our understanding is not, our refuge is not there. Not fully there. So what happens is you only purify part of it. So what happens is, uh, so Dojin will need to let some true to help us purify. All right. So Dojin has many, many, um, many, many uh, benef uh, uh, what do you call, of, of these abilities, of these benefits that will help us in our Dharma practice. There's no such deity, no such practice that will remove all karma, except except we become enlightened. So the only way to do that is through the Dharma practice, to, to practice Dharma, especially the higher practices. Okay, so I won't go so much into that now. So it's, um, okay, let me see what's the last few things I see some Alan Ku. I personally experienced Ocean's miracle that cured my skin infection because of a spiritual affliction. Oh, that's interesting. And Mr. Lam says, I was Uncle Lai's colleague back in 2000. He was a very nice man, patient, and very generous. He's sincere and friendly. Thank you very much. He is indeed. Alan Ku said, I was guided to Doyushin by my personal Kuan Yin after I prayed to her to guide me to a Buddha to heal my infection. One day, I switched on my PC, and the first page that appeared on my Google was Kachara website. Wow. That's interesting, huh? So you pray to Kuan Yin, uh, and then, yeah, Kuan Yin, there's no, there's no rivalry between the Bodhisattvas. Manjushri and Kuan Yin is, uh, Manjushri and Dodishin is the same. Uh, is there's no rivalry, no competition. Sometimes because um, the, the manifestation of Manjushri in the form of Dodishin is more effective to remove obstacles. So it's very good that you found a solution for your issue. Usually with skin problem, right, it's a Naga-related issue. You can read about it if you want. Okay. I've come to an end. Thank you very much, all of you guys, for joining me and sharing with me how, especially for Alan, thank you. I don't think I know who you are, but thank you for joining and sharing with us your experience with Dojishin's practice. And um, I've shared mine and how I personally, okay, before I finish, personally, I haven't asked Dodishin about anything specific. Let me think. Um, I have in the past asked for other people and it turned out to be very quick. Um, for myself, oh yes, it's of course. For myself, it's uh, my legal issues in recent years. I had some, a bunch of legal issues, personal e legal issues. And um, it came out exactly as was said by Dojo Shibu. Because I asked for, you know. Uh, anyway, yeah. So, uh, through Rinpoche and all that. And I had to do a bunch of pujas, including Dojo Shibu puja. So, it, he was very, very effective. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I'll be coming on in two weeks time let me see what's my next one uh next one is temple in the mall temple in the mall all right so i just i uh, hope you join me again in two weeks time thank you very much and good night